Hi, I'm Jack and welcome back because today I'm going to give you guys a review of the first installment in the Star Wars prequel trilogy, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. I am continuing my series of Star Wars movie reviews leading up to the release of Obi-Wan Kenobi on Disney+. Plus. So I hope you guys are going to stick along for the ride as I do this. And just to let you guys know, this is a spoiler review. So if you haven't seen The Phantom Menace yet, you have been warned. So go watch it on Disney+, Plus or anywhere else, and then see yourself right back here. And with that said, let's get started. The Phantom Menace follows Qui-Gon Jinn and his Padawan Obi-Wan Kenobi as they are caught in a trade dispute between the Galactic Republic and the Trade Federation. When a negotiation has gone wrong, they end up on Tatooine alongside Padme Amidala where they meet young Anakin Skywalker, a slave boy who seems to be very powerful with the Force, and Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan face Darth Maul. Everybody was so excited for The Phantom Menace back when it came out. It was the return to the galaxy far, far away several years after the original trilogy came to a close with Return of the Jedi. So the anticipation for this was at an all-time high. Everybody was excited to return to the galaxy and see what Star Wars was like before Leia, Han, and Luke had met one another and had their adventures. And it's safe to say that The Phantom Menace is... All right. It's... It has some great story ideas for the most part, but the execution was not quite there this time around. And I think to kick things off the positives, I think the score by John Williams, once again, is excellent. This is another one of the best Star Wars tracks um, of all time. We had some beautiful scores like Anakin's theme, which I think is really great and underrated. You have Duel of the Fates, which is awesome. There are some great scores here and there by John Williams. So once again, always delivers here the score here. Just like in every Star Wars movie we're going to get after this review, the score will always be a positive for the movie. And I do think that Liam Neeson and Ewan McGregor have a great dynamic with one another as Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. We got to see a much younger Obi-Wan in his past when he wasn't quite a Jedi Master just yet. And I really liked seeing him under the guidance of Qui-Gon Jinn. I think Liam is great. I think Ewan is great, and I really like their dynamic with one another as they're on this adventure. And I think that as a whole, those two characters were fun to watch for what the movie was. The movie starts off with Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan going to one of the Trade Federation ships to have a negotiation between Viceroy Gunray and them because there is a trade dispute between the Galactic Republic and so is the Trade Federation. And... Didn't quite happen. The negotiation didn't take place, but rather Darth Sidious at the time instructed them to kill the Jedi that were there. And so you had some cool little action bits with Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan taking on some droids, using their lightsabers and using their force abilities. Really cool to see there. And then they go on a ship and they go to Naboo where they end up meeting Jar Jar Binks. And Jar Jar Binks is not that great of a character. Nothing against Ahmed Best. He tried with what he was going for. Um, with the character, but I found the character to be even on just the writing level. I did not find Jar Jar that interesting or fun of a character. He's just too clumsy, too annoying, and I just did not find the character on screen to be that entertaining to me. Not like it's a bad thing, like it just feels so cringeworthy. I think the acting, aside from some key actors, I think are just overall, it's kind of one note for me. They didn't seem as invested to do this movie, and if they don't feel invested, then it's harder for me to get invested in this as well. And I think that really, aside from Liam Neeson and Ewan McGregor, some of the Jedi and Ian McDermott and them, everybody else just felt kind of wooden to me and they didn't feel like they were as excited to tell this story. Some of the lines feel kind of cringeworthy. There are iconic meme moments like these right here. The ability to speak does not make you intelligent. Now get out of here. Mm -hmm. You were right about one thing, Master. The negotiations were short. There's always a bigger fish. This is getting out of hand. Now there are two of them. Credits will do fine. But as a whole, a lot of the lines just don't feel as well executed. Like, I get the idea behind what was supposed to happen here, but it felt like there were just other ways that could have happened to make this probably a little bit better. Because a lot of the dialogue here, except for some of the more meme-worthy moments here, the dialogue as a whole is some of the weaker elements in this movie and so as some of the weaker dialogue to come out of the Star Wars saga. 
And then they go to Tatooine after they leave Naboo because they got attacked and they got to protect the senator. They go to Tatooine to find parts because they couldn't go all the way from there to Coruscant because they don't have enough power to do so. So they go to Tatooine where we meet Anakin Skywalker played by Jake Lloyd, who is, of course, as we know from the original trilogy, younger Darth Vader before he becomes Darth Vader. And I think that the idea with young Anakin, I think, is good. I think the idea of the relationship with him and Padme could have been better. I think Natalie Portman's a good actress in of herself, but I didn't think the material she was given was quite all that compelling there. And the Tatooine segment of this movie is where the pacing really bogs down because the movie's actually well paced in those first 30 minutes and even the back half of the movie. But when we're on Tatooine, the movie comes to an absolute halt. We're, because we're there for 40 minutes where it's like, here's Anakin, we need the parts, Watto, the pod race, mid chlorians It spends so much time on Tatooine that the whole movie is at an absolute stopping point until they get off the planet. And it's a bummer because this is an important part about the movie because you need Anakin and all of these things to happen in order for the story to progress but the Tatooine stuff feels kind of boring. And there are some good moments that come out of this, especially the dinner scene with Qui-Gon, Anakin, Padme, Jar Jar, and Shmi, who is Anakin's mother. And even the discussions between Qui-Gon and Anakin. And we even got to see C-3PO before he was in his finished form in this movie by Anthony Daniels once again. And it's nice to see C-3PO. He's not in this movie all that much, but seeing him was nice because it's C-3PO, big character in Star Wars. So it's nice to see him there for what it is. And R2-D2 is back here once again. R2-D2 is great uh, once again. But Tatooine as a whole could have been more interesting. And if it was a lot more interesting and better executed with like what was happening and better paced, the movie would have been a lot better for it because the stuff's important for the movie but it isn't as exciting because it just stops everything that's happening with the story. And then we are introduced to Darth Maul in this movie, The Apprentice of Darth Sidious. And Darth Maul is an awesome character, one of the highlights of this movie. Ray Park is great as this character, and I think he looks awesome. I love how the character is designed, and I love how menacing the character is. Whenever he's on screen, I always sit there, and I'm like, ooh, stuff's about to go down. And... It in fact does happen. Stuff happens with Darth Maul in this movie and he's just such an awesome character and I love the duels in this movie especially. I absolutely love what they do with him in the back half of the movie and I even like that they brought him back for even Star Wars The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels and more. I think he's an awesome character and I love what they start to do with him in the franchise after this movie. When it comes to Tatooine, though, I think the pod racing scene, I think that was a really cool sequence. They do film a lot of the stuff from the left, not so much from the right side of everything, but the idea of it and the way it was filmed, I actually was really liking that scene. I think it's an enjoyable moment seeing young Anakin race on this pod racer to win this pod race so that Qui-Gon can hopefully use that to free Anakin from Watto and Tatooine so that he can take uh, help him go on the path to becoming a Jedi, which we obviously know where that's going to go down. And I think it's a cool moment. Even though there's not as much tension felt in this movie, I did find something to be found in that moment. Because the rest of the movie also comes down to not just what happens in the forthcoming duel and Duel of the Fates, but in also this moment. Because this is the moment where Anakin can be free of his slavery in this movie because of what happens to his character and if he wins this race then he's free and then everything else can happen if not things would have gone out a lot differently if that were the case here but it's just a great moment i think it's well shot i think it's a fun sequence i think jake lloyd actually did really well here and i think um it's just really cool seeing this pod racer just speed throughout tatooine on a race course it's an awesome moment. I think it's really cool. I think George Lucas did really well with that moment. And then Anakin wins the race and Qui-Gon gets to free him from his current status on Tatooine. Even though there's a downside that Shmi couldn't be free. And that is also a sad thing because Watto and them wouldn't allow it. 
and Qui-Gon knew that because Anakin is so strong with the Force, because he had such a high midi-chlorian count, which was reported to Obi-Wan Kenobi, it led to the realization that it's like, I can't free her, but I can free you. And she feels like, take, let him be free. You gotta let Anakin go off and leave Tatooine so that he can go live life, go beyond the galaxy and go become a Jedi and, and the, train in the ways of the Force. And I think from that point on, Anakin leaves with Qui-Gon and them and the relationship with Padme strictly just friends even though you see you can feel some things between the two of the characters they head back and this is where we get our first duel from darth maul and this is the first encounter between our heroes and darth maul in this movie and i love how darth maul comes in speeding over there as he almost ran over anakin and he immediately puts out his lightsaber and we start dueling be between Qui-Gon and Darth Maul. It's an awesome little moment that doesn't last for too long, but it's a cool moment nevertheless. Because one thing about the prequel trilogy that's terrific are the lightsaber duels. And then they leave Tatooine and they finally head to Coruscant where the rest of the movie can finally progress after being on Tatooine for 40 to 50 minutes long. Uh, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan go to the Jedi Temple where they can tell all the Jedi that they think the Sith have returned because Qui-Gon just had an encounter with Darth Maul right before they left, and the fact that Anakin has such a high midi-chlorian count that makes him so strong with the Force, even more powerful than Yoda, that he might be our chosen one, and they may not believe it, they were hesitant to believe it, and that they don't want Qui-Gon to train Anakin just because he has one Padawan, and the Jedi code says a Jedi Master can only have one apprentice, and that the fact that they think Anakin is vulnerable with the dark side and also because they left his mother there and what that's going to mean. And so they were hesitant to let it happen and they furthermore declined having Qui-Gon train Anakin. And then Padme Amidala gets sent to Coruscant to plead her case in this galactic council with the Trade Federation because a lot of this movie revolves around a treaty very much has a lot of a political aspect to it and I don't quite get it. I don't, I don't think this side of the story is really all that investing to me. So it comes off as just there to me, even though it's supposed to be important for this overall story and what's set up to come. So with Padme Amidala, alongside Chancellor Palpatine, played by Ian McDermott once again, he they persuade that like they need to have a new leader to run the Galactic Senate because they don't think our current Supreme Chancellor is fit to do the job. So they brought elect who um, a new leader who ends up being Chancellor Palpatine. So she ends up successful, but because she doesn't like the corruption within the Senate, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, they, they both, they leave Coruscant, they return to Naboo, where a lot of the third act stuff starts to kick in. And then this sets up our third act, where Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, and Padme team up with the Gungans, Jar Jar's race of people, so that they can form an alliance to take on the Trade Federation, because they're sending droids down to destroy them. And our climax of this movie finally kicks into high gear, where we have three different battles where um, Padme and them, they try to stop Viceroy Gunray and them for what's happening with the Trade Federation. And then you have the fight between the Gungans and Jar Jar, who be becomes a general against the Trade Federation droids. And then you got the awesome duel between Obi-Wan Qui-Gon versus Darth Maul titled Duel of the Fates, the best part of the movie, in fact. And it's an awesome duel from the choreography to the score by John Williams to the performances by Ray Park, Ewan McGregor, and Liam Neeson. And so as what happens here, it's a phenomenal sequence, one of the best lightsaber duels in the franchise. It's up there with Anakin versus Obi-Wan Battle of the Heroes, Luke and Darth Vader Return of the Jedi and Empire. It's a great sequence the only thing really lacking here is that i'm not as invested in those characters at that point besides obi-wan kenobi but thankfully what i do love about the scene is that it really is about like what will happen to anakin's fate will qui-gon be able to train him will it be obi-wan or could the dark side get to anakin and i think it's a great moment because it really just symbolizes and it really is that turning point in Anakin's fate and I think that's what makes it really cool as a whole not just for the cool choreography and all the stuff that happens and how it is culminated but also because it's really a lot about Anakin as well 
even if Anakin is on a starship destroying a Trade Federation ship, which is an awesome moment too, and all that. It's just that the other two parts of the climax aren't as investing as the duel with Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon, and Darth Maul. Everything else is fine, and I think another problem I have with this movie, especially in the other parts of the climax, is it can be very over on CGI, especially in the climax. There are a lot of moments where the droids and the Gungans, they don't feel as convincing, and I don't think they, they don't hold up as well as they did probably in 1999, but it doesn't take me out of the movie entirely, but it's over-reliant on it. But nevertheless, the sequences themselves are pretty cool. It has a cool climax in a sense. Not one of the best in Star Wars history, aside from the Duel of the Fates moment. But Duel of the Fates is awesome. I love how we got to see them use the Force in their techniques with the light and the dark side as they take on each other. Darth Maul is, again, excellent antagonist. I love him here. Doesn't say much, but he's menacing. And I love that. And he is a very formidable foe against Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. And seeing Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan take on him. And even the double-bladed saber, I think, was awesome. Because never had I thought when I was younger that there was going to be a thing like a double-bladed lightsaber. But here we are. And it's just a cool moment. And I love that it goes on. And then they kind of get separated a little bit. Where Obi-Wan gets trapped between kind of the barriers as Qui-Gon and Darth Maul start to fight, and it culminates in Darth Maul killing Qui-Gon. And it is just a very shocking moment in this movie, and I think it's excellent for this, this movie for what it was trying to tell. And I love that now that Qui-Gon is dead, it leaves Obi-Wan hanging, and Obi-Wan unleashes his ability on Darth Maul because he killed his master. And not only because of that, but it's like, what's going to happen with Anakin? Because this whole fate is also important in Anakin as a character because of what it's going to mean for him in the future. So I really like that. And I think it was so cool to even have a moment where Obi-Wan looked like he's about to fail. He's all the way down there on the verge of possibly falling if he were to let go. And then got Darth Maul up there and Obi-Wan force jumps, uses Qui-Gon's lightsaber and boom slices Darth Maul in half and that also so kickstarts that rivalry between the two of them that ends up happening throughout the franchise with the Clone Wars and I think that is a really cool way to wrap up Darth Maul in this movie even though we didn't get as much Maul and not as much characterization out of the character of Maul but I do think he's a cool character in terms of like his presence and the lightsaber stuff and design I think is cool but I love what they do with him later in the franchise. So that was awesome. And I think it's a nice way to wrap up that whole conflict in this movie. And Qui-Gon wants Obi-Wan to train Anakin. And therefore, Viceroy Gunray and them are defeated. And the Gungans em emerge victorious against the droids. And so as Anakin destroys that Trade Federation ship, which is a great moment for him. Because he is an awesome pilot and a really good one, in fact. And then Obi-Wan becomes a Jedi Master and trains Anakin Skywalker so that the rest of the story can go along. And it's a nice way to wrap things up as Qui-Gon was killed in the Duel of the Fates. And Viceroy Gunray and them have been arrested. And the Jedi and the heroes have emerged victorious in Naboo. And it's a nice way to close out the movie. And I think George Lucas is just a fantastic storyteller. He comes up with fantastic ideas that I think are really great. But sometimes I don't think directing and writing is quite his strongest suit here. And it's apparent here and even in the next movie. So I admire his creativity. I admire he tries to do something and that he got to make the movie he wants to make out of this. So at least I respect him for that. I think there's some great ideas to be found here. There's some great moments here, especially the pod racing scene, the Duel of the Fates. And even the dynamic between Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon is good. It's just some of the acting as a whole feels pretty one note. And some of the story ideas weren't quite as well executed as they could be. And the pacing is not that great. So in the end, The Phantom Menace is not the worst Star Wars movie. It's not an atrocious movie. It's not a horrible movie like everybody says it is. And it is a lot better for me on rewatch this time around than my previous viewing. But I still don't think it's enough for me to call this a good movie. So in the end, I'm going to give Star Wars The Phantom Menace a C. And I only recommend this movie for Star Wars fans. As a start to the prequel trilogy, it's okay. Great moments, 
but the sum of its parts are far better than the movie as a whole. So there are moments about this movie that I can watch, I can appreciate it, but as a whole, the movie is not quite as investing to me. And at, out of the four Star Wars movies I've reviewed, this is my least favorite, even though it's not my least favorite Star Wars movie as a whole. So yeah, it's an okay movie. Could have been better. I appreciate some ideas and I do think there are some really great moments to be had here. And I do like that it lays the groundwork for what's to come in the prequel trilogy. So yeah, those are my thoughts on Star Wars The Phantom Menace. What did you think of this movie? Let me know down below in the comments section. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And stay tuned. I have a review for Star Wars Attack of the Clones coming up soon. And oh boy, that's going to be something. I hope you guys will stay tuned for that. And don't forget to follow me on social media. My username is down below at the bottom of the screen and in the description below. So don't forget to do that while you're at it. And thank you guys so much for watching. And don't forget to hit that like button and the subscribe button. And stay tuned for more. Oh, my God.